You're listening to the podcast of The Branch in Ashland, Virginia. The word Christian was first used in the first century in Antioch to describe the people who were talking about and following after Jesus Christ. 2,000 years later, has the word lost some of its original meaning? Do we need to use other terms to bring clarity to its meaning? That's what we'll talk about today. It's no secret that I didn't grow up around here. And uh, I'm always fascinated as I've lived north and south uh, about the the different uh, terms that mean something different wherever you go, you know, in my neck of the woods, right? Like some up in New England, when when you say wicked, it doesn't mean bad, it means good, right? And so if you've ever encountered, in fact, once upon a time, I was thinking about this this week, once upon a time there was a beer called Pete's Wicked Ale. I don't know if they still make it anymore, but it was a New England one. If you go out to the Midwest, uh, you don't call soda soda, you call it pop. Um, which the first time I heard that, I was kind of scratching my head too. Cer- certain parts of the country, uh, you don't even call it, you call everything Coke. Like whether it's Sprite or Pepsi or whatever, uh, it's, it's all the same thing. Um, so I, I decided this week I was going to do a, a social media experiment and I, I put this question up for people and said, what phrases come to mind that mean something completely different where you're from uh, than they mean elsewhere? And so, yeah, I put on the top of the list, wicked uh, for New England. Um, funny, a lot of these are from the South and I don't know if it's just that we've got uh, certain vernacular in the South that uh, other people just don't have. Maybe we're more cultured uh, than other places. I don't know, but um, y'all, you all becomes y'all. Um, I remember the first time I heard someone, a girl say, I'm fixing to, and I was really scratching my head, and I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So I needed to hear it a couple times in context before I finally realized, like, oh, that means you're getting ready to do something, right? Well, why don't you just say that? Um, bless your heart, obviously. Uh, anyone who's grown up or is, has been around here long enough knows that bless your heart doesn't really mean bless your heart. Um, and then upstate, like growing up around uh, New England and New York. Um, see, New York City thinks that they're the only part of New York, um, but there's a whole state upstate from New York. But then we moved to Asheville uh, and realized that in South Carolina, Spartanburg area of South Carolina, they call the upstate. And I was like, "What? A, that's weird to me. But it's upstate from the rest of the state. And so, um, what, down east? Oh, yeah. So yeah, it was a fascinating thing. And I, I realized that, you know, language is so clunky at times that, that you have to really dig into terms to really get a feel for what's the context here? Does it mean what I think it means? Does it mean something else based on where I am? And, and sometimes we need to dig into terms in order to get better clarity and uh, to, to avoid confusion, to avoid misunderstanding. Sometimes there are terms that are used for people and things that are disparaging, that people might say things and you think, I mean, bless your heart's probably one of those things that like someone says it to you and you're like, oh, how kind. And you're like, no, I don't think he meant it that way. (laughs) Um, But sometimes that happens. And so I, I wonder if sometimes do we need to think through terms, deconstruct some of them, and then reconstruct them uh, better terms in their place. And uh, so that's kind of what I wanted us to, to focus on today as we continue through this series called Reconstruction. If you were with us last week or you watched online or, um, or listened online, then uh, you heard the verses that we shared to beginning and I want to begin and I want to kind of anchor us down in these verses throughout this series. Um, next week, uh, Bill Moore from Restoration Church will be here uh, and he will uh, hopefully do the same thing with Colossians 3, 1 through 3. If you're so inclined uh, and you're good at memorizing, um, I'm going to do my best to commit these verses uh, to memory over the next few weeks. And so, uh, I, but I would like to today to read them together. If you wouldn't mind standing with me. So let's read this together. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. And someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. 
For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. You know what? Those are the wrong verses. And I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking to myself, those, it was supposed to be 3, 1 through 3. So let me read 3, 1 through 3. Go ahead and sit down. And, and these are the verses that we're going to, to work on um, and memorize. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. In, in the book of Acts, we, we have the biblical account of what happened after Jesus rose from the dead. In the beginning of Acts, Jesus appears to the apostles and he gives them instructions. And then we see how with just 12 people, God expands the world with the message of the gospel. The fact that, that God sent his son Jesus to come, to live, to die and on our behalf and to, to be uh, the solution for, for the sin problem that we have. And as we walk through the book of Acts, we, we see how the church expands. And first, uh, we see the first martyr in Acts chapter 7 with Stephen. Stephen is connecting the dots for some of the Jews that, that he's speaking to. And he's telling them that, hey, Jesus, the one that you all just crucified, guess what? He's the connection point for us. He, he's the one who's the, the fulfillment of the message that's been there since God called Abraham out from among the nations. And what happens is the people don't like to be told that they were uh, doing something wrong, and they stone Stephen. He becomes the first martyr, and uh, what happens after that is that people, as they're persecuted, they begin to scatter. Well, and I think that was God's plan, because as they scatter, what do they bring with them? But they bring the gospel message with them. And then in Acts 11, we read through uh, a little bit more of of some of the events that happened and. Um, In Acts chapter 11, starting in verse 19, this is what we read. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks, also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. And Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church, taught great numbers of people, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, I think it's really important when we look at passages like this too, to, uh, sometimes I think when we read them, we automatically put them into our context. Um, but I think it's important it, to look at a map to say, hey, where are we talking about here? Um, if you look on this map, Jerusalem's all the way down here. You go s- north to Antioch, and again, we don't necessarily know. There's, there's a scale on there that tells us, but uh, just to let you know that Antioch was about 300 miles from Jerusalem. Now, 300 miles today doesn't seem like a ton. You know, uh, we're getting ready to drive to Connecticut. It's a 400-mile drive uh, for my family and I. Um, we can do that in half a day. 300 miles today was nothing, but back then, before airplanes and trains and automobiles, uh, they had to walk that. And if you're figuring that they walked about 15 miles a day um, or 20 miles a day, it's going to take about two weeks to get from Jerusalem up to Antioch. So think about this. 
Jesus, he dies, he rises again, he comes back. The day of Pentecost happens in Acts chapter 2. The the Jews are scattered, the new Christians, the new believers are scattered, and they go as far as 300 miles, and the message of Jesus continues to be proclaimed up there, and news travels all the way back to Jerusalem. Now again, they weren't hopping on Twitter or Instagram or anything and getting that message like it had to go by foot. And so it's a significant thing to think about how far the message of Jesus is traveling in such a short period of time. And it's here in Antioch that they're fine, that the term Christians comes out. If we look in Scripture, there's only three times uh, that that word is actually used in the New Testament. And two of those times was actually used by people who weren't yet Christians. They were people who needed some kind of distinguisher in order to say, hey, how about these people over here? Uh, They weren't necessarily considered Jews anymore because they believed differently than the Jews. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah that they had been told about. And so here in Antioch, they use that term Christian. I mean, it's something that we... It makes sense to us probably because you think about someone from North Carolina, right? They're a North Carolinian, right? You associate them with the state. Someone from Texas is a Texan. And so somebody who's associated with Christ, with Jesus Christ, was called a Christian back then. Those who were following Jesus had distinguished themselves from other people, from other Jews, in fact, because the name of Jesus was constantly on their lips as they went and did all the things that they had done. And so, close to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, a word like Christian may have had more weight, but 2,000 years later, has it, has it lost some of its meaning? You know, when we say Christian now, uh, it means something very different. There are certain things that we could probably put before it or afterwards, which again, um, may raise some people's blood pressure when they hear that term. And Christian, right after the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, may have meant something significantly more impactful than even it does today. And so, is being a Christian, like, what, what is it? What, when we say, hey, I'm a Christian, again, does it mean what it meant back in the book of Acts? Is it somebody who goes to church? If we come and say, well, you know, I was there on Sunday, and so, you know, therefore I'm a Christian. But like, if I go home and I sit in my garage, I'm not a car, right? Just because I'm sitting in the garage. So does that mean that just because we're in church, that means we're Christians? No, I think there's something more to it than that. We, we need a little bit more around the definition of it. Is being a Christian simply about believing in Jesus? Um, is, is believing in Jesus enough for us to be saved? Is that all there is to it? When Paul and Silas in the book of Acts and Acts 16 are, are in prison, And an earthquake comes and they're released from their chains and they stay there. The jailer's blown away because they don't walk out the door. And he says to them, you know, what what must I do to be saved? And what does Paul say in Acts chapter 16, verse 31? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. And so, yes, belief is is significant to to saying, hey, I'm saved and a Christian. But then... We would go over to James chapter 2, the letter that J- James wrote to the early Christians. This is what James says. He says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good, even the demons believe that and shudder. So I think in some, some ways, James was hanging out with Peter because he's saying provocative things and saying that if all you say is that you believe, then that's fine and great, but so do the demons, and it's not doing them any good. And so is belief simply enough? Or does, do we need something more? And are faith and belief the same thing? When we think about those words together, are they the same thing? I don't necessarily think so. 
I think belief is part of it, but it moves past a scent of knowledge and information. If I say, I believe that, I don't have to do anything with that. I can say, yeah, I believe this chair will hold me. I believe that, you know, when I go outside that it's going to be sunny. I can believe a lot of things, but is there any action behind it? And you see, faith is belief in action. Faith is doing more than just verbally assenting to something. It's, it's actually putting weight behind our belief and saying, hey, I'm not only going to say I believe this, but I'm going to do something differently. This belief is going to change the way that I act. It's going to change my behavior. That's what faith really is. And faith and belief are part of what it means to be a Christian. But, but is there something else? Again, if we go back to the book of Acts and and look at some of the things that happened there in Acts chapter 2, Peter's addressing the crowd who's hearing some of this message for the first time. And in Acts 2, 38 through 39, this is what Peter says. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And so, again, we don't talk about it a lot here at the branch, but being part of the Reformed tradition, that second verse in 39, this idea of of children being baptized because we believe that part of the covenant promise of God is that it's not just for us who believe, but it's also for our children as well. And so, but Paul, but Peter says to them, when it comes to belief that, hey, repentance and baptism are actually part of this. That part of our distinction from other people is that we've repented. And repentant isn't just saying, say, repenting isn't just saying, hey, I'm sorry. Repenting is actual, if we look at the Greek word, it's a turning away from something. That when we repent of something, we don't just say, hey, I'm sorry, or ooh, this stinks because I got caught, so I'm, let me just apologize to you. It's, no, I've realized that, that I've done something wrong, and I've turned away from it, and I've gone in the opposite direction. And that's a turning away. It's not only confession, but it's a change. And baptism is an outward symbol you know, for the sacraments that we talk about. Uh, we talk, uh, I think it was uh, Martin Luther who talked about the fact that, that they're outward symbols of an inward grace. Baptism is a sign to people. There's nothing special that happens in terms of salvation, but it's a symbol. And we read through the book of Acts, we see over and over and again that when people were baptized, it meant that, hey, they were putting on uh, this, this name of Jesus. Um, It wasn't simply just saying, hey, I'm a Christian, and that's it. But there was action behind it. And baptism was part of that description. And so Christians were called Christians by those who weren't necessarily Christians too. They, they needed a term, and that was the term that stuck. But, but there were other names as we read through not just the book of Acts, but throughout uh, the letters in the New Testament. Um, there are other things that distinguished uh, and that were used, other terms that were used for people who followed after Jesus. But so far as we've looked at all this, well, what, what are the things that have been kind of those distinguishers for and these characteristics of what it means to be a Christian? So yes, belief, yes, faith, repentance, being baptized. But is there anything else? And what other words were used to describe these early believers? One word that's used throughout the letters in the New Testament and elsewhere is the word saints. No, I'm not talking about the New Orleans football team either here. I'm talking about those who had been set apart and are being made holy. And so those who followed after Jesus were called saints. It wasn't uncommon for Paul to use that term and to say, hey, saints. I remember riding the bus when I was a a kid and um, the, the bus driver found out that I was either my dad was a pastor or something. And he said, oh, are you a saint? And I'd never heard that 
term before, and I just kind of scratched my head and walked to the back of the bus, I think. But, but it was a term that is used if we look through the New Testament for those who say, hey, I'm following after Jesus. Another term is faithful ones. Um, those who have committed faithfully to the instructions of Jesus. Jesus' instructions to the disciples and the followers of him afterwards, this great commission was to go and to baptize and to teach people everything that he had taught them. And so part of that is following after uh, the teachings of Jesus and being faithful to the commitment that is made to Jesus. But also brothers, if we look through, and we can add sisters to that too, just, but um, the, the term was a familial term. You know, I have a, a good friend who I call my brother all the time um, because we're, we're close friends. When we use a term like that, it's saying, hey, we're family. We're connected to one another. And, and that's the way that, that Christians should be. It should be a distinction of us that we say, hey, I'm part of a community that's not just like loosely connected. I'm connected with other people in such a way that, that we're kind of friends or the family that you choose, right? Like these are, these are people who feel like family to me and it shouldn't be something that we say hey well this is great like we experience this we feel it all you know for an hour on Sunday and then we walk out the door and I say those people are I'm just going to leave them there or does it carry on through the week do we say you know and that's one of the things that gives me great joy is that when I hear about the connections that people within the community of the branch are making with one another that go beyond just friends it goes towards family and I say wow we're caring for one another in such a way that there's a distinction there um, followers, that was a common word, again, that was used for the early uh, Christians, people who were following after Jesus. Yes, the disciples showed that, but um, following after what Jesus taught, following after how he lived. And then finally, disciples. And the word disciple in Greek, methetes, is, is a word that really means student and means pupils and learners. And so part of being a Christian is also not saying, hey, I got it all figured out. I believe in Jesus. I'm putting my faith in him and that's it. It means that we're constantly learning. You know, I, I, I'm always blown away when I meet people who have been Christians for years and there's no evidence that, that they believe that they're disciples. Like they've stayed the same through years. Part of my conversation with, with people over and over again is, God, I hope that I'm not the same person that I was yesterday. I I hope that I'm not the same person I was five years ago. And even conversations I had this week, I said, look, like the John of five years ago or 10 years ago never would have done that in a good way. Like I would say, hey, like I never even would have thought that was a good idea. But somehow or another, because I've allowed myself to be a disciple, allowed the teachings of Jesus to change me and to transform me, I can say, hey, I'm different than I was. That's what it means to really be a Christian. You know, a few years back when we were starting the branch, we went through a series called Disciple, and every letter of disciple had a- another word, so it was an acronym for something else. And, and I, I think that the words that we used were good descriptors for us. The D stood for dying the self, which, you know, hey, that's a great way to start, right? Because it's somewhat provocative. We don't always think about that in terms of what it means to follow after Jesus. But we're dying to ourselves. We're in investing in others, that we care about the people who are around us. We're spirit-led. We don't just run after the things that we want to run after, but we're constantly saying, Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me in the ways that I should go. We're conformed to Christ. We're not conformed, as Paul said, we're not conformed to the pattern of this world. We're conformed to to Christ and we're being made and transformed into the image of God in which we were created. Um, We invite others on this journey. 
that it's not just about saying, hey, I'm good, like I've got my fire insurance, and when I die, I'm going to heaven. To heck with all of you, I'm not going to say anything. No, we should be invite, inviting others to be part of that, to, to experience, explore, and encounter the story of God and what their place is in the story of God. We should be prayerful, constantly praying before the Lord, putting things before the Lord, and saying, lead me, guide me, um, take me, change me, transform me, renew me, regenerate me, reconstruct me. Uh, we should be learning Jesus' ways. That we're constantly, you know, the way that God has revealed himself to us is through his, his written word and through his incarnate word, Jesus Christ. And so we should be learning the ways of Jesus and then we should be engaging the culture. Uh, we shouldn't just say, okay, I, I, I'm a Christian and so I'm going to only do Christian things and I'm going to be in a Christian house and a Christian school and a Christian church and I never do anything that's not Christian. Um, while I admire the, the, <laughs> the sentiment behind that, I don't think that's what we're called to. I think that God's put us here and throughout Scripture when we read through it, we see that um, God has constantly called his people from out from among others, but he never leaves them there. He always tells them to go back. Uh, the exilic books of the New Old Testament show us that over and over again. Jeremiah, where, where God says to the exiles, hey, go and seek the peace and prosperity, not of your household or your church, but of the place where God has planted you. Wherever it is that you are, we should be engaging the culture and bringing this message out. You know, like I said, my friend Bill is going to be here next week preaching, and I love the definition of a disciple that he came up with a few years ago. He said, a disciple is someone who looks, loves, and lives like Jesus. I think if we were to think that if I was called a Christian and that's what it meant, then I might be okay with that. Um, because Christian doesn't have to do with how I vote. It doesn't have to do with uh, other, other things at all. It has to do with whether I look in a love and I live like Jesus does. And so does Christian seem like an adequate descriptor? Is the disciple better? And maybe we're all just saying, well, we're just splitting hairs here because, you know, does it really matter anyway? Um, you know, in the world of Gallup that I find myself in as a strengths coach, uh, one of the things that they will say is that clarity is kindness. I think we live in a world where things are very unclear all the time. And for us as followers of Jesus to be able to bring clarity is kind to other people. And sometimes when we give better descriptions, when we can take away misunderstanding and uh, mis conception of things, then maybe we can bring more clarity. You know, I, I heard a, a joke years ago that probably hits a little bit too close to home in some ways. Um, <clears throat> this guy was on a bridge, and as he's walking across, he, he sees uh, another guy on the bridge getting ready to throw himself off, and he says, hey, you know, don't, don't do that. God loves you. He says, don't, don't you believe in God? And the, the guy who's on the brink of jumping off the bridge says, yeah. And the other guy says, hey, are you a Christian or a Jew? And the guy says, He's a, I'm a Christian. He says, oh, great, me too. Well, you a, a Protestant or you a Catholic? And he says, I'm a Protestant. And he says, oh, great. Well, what, what denomination? And he says, well, I'm a Baptist. He said, great, I am, I am too. Were you a Northern Baptist or you a Southern Baptist? He said, oh, I'm a Northern Baptist. And the other guy says, great, me too. Were you a, a Northern Conservative Baptist or are you a Northern Liberal Baptist? The guy says, I'm a Northern Conservative Baptist. The other guy responds, yeah, great, me too. Well, are you a Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region? Or are you a North, Northern Conservative Baptist Eastern region? He says, oh, I'm a Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region. He says, great, so am I, me too. And he says, well, are you a North Conser Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region council of 1879? Or are you a Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region council of 1912? And the guy responds, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. The other guy says, die heretic, and he pushes him off the bridge. <laughs> and, and as much as we might think to ourselves, are we really that complicated? I, I think sometimes we, we do get so caught up in some of that stuff. Theology is important. Doctrine is important. Distinguishers are important. 
But what might even be more important than that is whether or not those things actually mean anything when it comes to how we live. We can put terms and labels on everything we want, but if our lives don't back that, then what does it matter? And what did Paul say when he was writing to the early church in Corinth? You know, he's in 1 Corinthians 13, which we use at weddings all the time, but he says, look, if you don't have love, then you're just a clanging cymbal. You're a banging gong. It doesn't matter. If you don't have something to back up what you're saying, then does it really matter? Our actions reveal what we believe and what do they reveal to the people around us. You know, if we were judged, if we were called something based upon what we did, what would we be called? You know, that really in Antioch and, and around that early first century, the reason why Christians were called what they were called is because of how they lived. Because they saw that there's something different here and we're associating them with Jesus. In John 13, 35, Jesus said, By this everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. And so are we just putting Christian on like a worn piece of clothing or a nice comfortable pair of shoes and then taking it off like Mr. Rogers at the end of the day and putting it back in the closet? Or is it something that we're wearing and embodying all throughout the week? Do people know, not just because we wear the sign or the symbol or the fish or whatever and say, hey, I'm a Christian, do they know because of the way we live? Does bearing the name of Jesus give us dignity or are we looking for dignity elsewhere? Because as ones who are called after God, who are created in the image of God, that's where our dignity comes from. And so are we letting people know? And really, what is the fruit of our discipleship? You know, we can say we're Christians all day long, just like we can go in a, in a, car, in a garage and say we're a car. But like, does it really mean something? What is the fruit? What do people see in our lives throughout the week? Not just Sunday, because we decide to come and spend an hour together, but how about the rest of the week? Do people see Jesus in us? How are we changing and transforming? And then how are we helping to be part of change and transformation in the people, in the community, in the world around us? You know, I would much rather someone say, I see that you're a Christian rather than I hear that you're a Christian. Tell me that you know what I am by what you see rather than what you hear. Yes, they're both equally important. We need to make sure that, that what people hear is important, but they're together. Faith, belief, yes, what I say, but also what I do. What is the outworking of that? And so what do we do with all this? You know, ask yourself this question. What describes us better, a term or our actions? You know, if, if people were to have to come up with a term for you, what would they say? And would the term t describe you better than what your actions are doing? And then in the midst of that, again, like I, I, as I've turned the corner of 50 in my own life, I've started to say, you know, there's so much negativity around us all the time. Everyone focuses on the negative and what's wrong. How can we say, hey, how do we focus on, on doing things better? Instead of saying, well, oh, the word Christian sucks, let's just throw it out. Are there ways that we can bring clarity to the people around us? to let them know that you may have heard Christian before, but I'm going to let you know that it means something different to me than it might mean to you. And here's how by how I live. How can we bring clarity to the people around us so that when they hear that term, they might scratch their head and go, you're a different Christian than any of the other Christians I've met before. Not because we're better but because we take to heart the fact that Jesus said, I want you to look like me. I want you to act like me. I want you to love like me. And when we do that, people can see Jesus in us. And that's the moniker they give us, not out of you know, frustration or anything else, but because they see Jesus in us. May we be Christians and called such, not because it's just a term, but because people see Jesus in us all week long. Let me pray.
Jesus, you gave yourself up for us. Not just for us to have a term or something to wear, a sign, a fish, anything. God, you gave your son Jesus to us so that we would be changed and we would be transformed. And so, Father, may we live in such a way that people see you in us that we are transformed, that we are not the people that we once were. And every day, we're a little bit different. And you're doing more of a work in us today than you did yesterday. And you've done more of a work in us and will do more of a work in us tomorrow. So God, may we be your advocates, your agents. May we be people who say, hey, we don't want to just wear this term Christian. We want to live this term Christian. And we want people to see and know you because of how we live. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Is Christian just a term that we put on or can people see through our lives and actions that we're actually followers of Jesus? Is there fruit in our lives that shows people who we are following? I hope you'll consider all we've talked about today as you interact with the people around you. How can God use you to bring clarity to the word Christian for those around you? Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at thebranchashland at gmail.com. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, give us a review, and share with your friends and family. Thanks for listening. See you next time.